Welcome to the program today. My name is Mono Gonzalez and I'm here in studio with Karen. Hi everyone. And we are here with some question and answers that we appreciate uh, all of you sending them in. And it doesn't have to be on prophecy, it can be on a variety of things. We like to uh, research and, and do our homework here. And so if you do want to send in a question, you can send them to questions at prophecywatchers.com. And um, you might not get an answer immediately, but we will put it in the bank of all the other questions that we get, and we will get to it uh, eventually. So we will definitely get to it. So why don't we get to it, Karen? Okay. What, what do we have? We have a few questions We today. have some really good questions. You're really good at picking the really good ones out of the vault. So we're going to start with this one from William. Can you please explain how long a generation is? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. This actually is a really good question. Some of you have had it. I know I've had it in the past. And, and scholars will go back and forth. Uh, there's really two, to two topics to this particular question. One of them is the idea of this generation. Which generation is it? Some believe that um, all the things that Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, or most of them, were fulfilled in 70 AD. Therefore, this generation, the one that Jesus was talking to at the time um, and giving the descriptions of the destruction of the temple, the end of the age, and his return. And so uh, some of those who are uh, what they would call themselves as, as partial preterists, who believe that uh, Really, Jesus' destruction, uh, Jesus' return happened in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. So for them, they interpret this as, well, this generation, and it was all fulfilled. Therefore, Jesus is a true prophet. Uh, other people say, well, if you look at everything that Jesus mentioned in the Olivet Discourse, there's no way that all that happened in 70 AD. There's just too much information. It's too broad, especially if you look at Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, uh, all those three chapters. So the way that they answer it is when Jesus begins and he shifts his conversation um, in talking to the disciples and answering those three questions, he says, for those that see uh, primarily uh, the abomination of desolation from Matthew 24, 15 and on, the rest of that, that happens in the middle of the tribulation as well as some other things. But he says when the generation at that time that sees these things, what things? Well, including the abomination of desolation, uh, which we know is, happens in the middle of the tribulation. Um, that generation will by no means pass away because uh, during that time, you imagine if you're living during the seven year tribulation, uh, you wonder, you, it, you might not be very knowledgeable in the Bible. Um, many of those people are going to be um, saved after the rapture, which we believe is before the tribulation period. And they're going to be confused. How long is this going to last? When is Jesus coming? Uh, we know that, you know, friends and family told us about it. Oh, no, oh no. When is Jesus coming? And so th this phrase is, hey, the generation that is seeing these things will not pass. So they know that it's not going to be forever. It's not going to last a lifetime. It's not going to last hundreds of years. Because we do know that from the time that Jesus left in the first coming until now, it's been a long time. And he talks about the end of the age. The age is certainly longer than 70 years or even 40 years from the time of Jesus' death and ascension to 70 AD. So the phrase this generation is referring to that generation who is watching the things happen that he mentions specifically during the seven-year tribulation. So that's how we would answer that question. But the second question is, how long is a generation? Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a common question. And, you know, there's really many answers because, and what you have is people trying to go out into the Bible, which is fine, and they're trying to define a generation uh, in the Bible. And therefore, once they get that magic number, then they will say, all right, all we have to do is add that magic number to a specific time point and a starting point, and that'll get us the end. So I'll give you several examples. For example, I have here um, in Psalm 95, verse 10, it says this, uh, for 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. And it also, this, this idea of that generation appears in Hebrews chapter 3. It's describing the wilderness generation, that God was upset um, with them and they all perished in the wilderness. So it says here, I was grieved with them for 40 years. Voila, a generation is 40 years. So, People who ran with that, then the question was, okay, now that we have the number in the God's word, 
let's put it on the starting clock. Well, the starting clock was 1948, Israel becoming nation. So now you have 1948 plus 40. Then you have a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Returning in 1988, uh, amongst many, and this was one of them. Well, that didn't work out. So then they're like, okay, so we still know it's 40, 40 years because the Bible says I was grieved with that generation 40 years. It must be then Israel's um, conquering of Jerusalem and recovering it um, in 1967 in the Six-Day War. So now we have 1967 plus 40 years. Now we have 2007 minus seven-year tribulation. Voila, again, now the rapture is happening in the year 2000. Isn't it obvious? Obviously. So... I, you know, I was part of watching this conversation. You know, I've been watching this for a while, and you're like, oh. So the next one you have is uh, Jack Van Empey, uh, who, again, Bible answer man. He, did, based on Matthew 1.17, it says this, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to, the, to Christ, 14 generations. So now you have... 42 generations, okay? It's using the word generation. So roughly 2,160 years from Abraham to Jesus, divided by 42 or 41, it depends on what you want. And now we have a generation equaling 52. So, and that's in the Bible. But it's a little bit with history too. But now if you do the calculations out and scholars will say, well, not all the generations were reflected in that genealogy. But when you start calculating that out, now you go to 1948 plus 52, now you're at, you know, different numbers, 2019 and 1967, and, and so again, you think, okay, well, which one are we going to use? Are we going to use the 40 generation? Are we going to use 52? I got more. Okay, in Psalm 90, verse 10, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble, they are soon gone, and we fly away. So based on this one, we have a generation equaling 70 or 80 years. So now you calculate 1948 plus 70, and you start getting into 2018, then minus seven, now it's 2011. But what about 80 years? Now it's 2028. You know, the rapture is going to be this year because the, the tribulation will begin um, in 21 so that Jesus returns in 2028. So you have a variety of these things. Um, the last one, which people don't really like, is in, in Genesis 6, 3, it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Now we have 120 year uh, potential generation. So you put that on 1948. Now we're at 2068, or uh, you put that on to 2087. And so at the end of the day, the problem is, is if we take the... Um, the need to find a generation in a specific number. Again, we're looking for that time clock. But I think all of those um, really pursuits are irrelevant because yes, Israel becoming a nation is super important and there's no doubt um, it begins to um, reveal to us that we are at the end of the age. Um, but the idea of this generation is not uh, looking for a calculation specifically in a number. It's talking about those that are alive at that time uh, when we begin to see the th things happening in the seven-year tribulation will not pass away. So that's how we would answer it. And I would encourage anybody, don't get stuck into some of these things because it's really, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, a rabbit hole because you could argue, again, you could argue the 40, you could argue the 52, you could argue the 70 or 80 or even the 120. And uh, I just think it's missing the point. This is why we don't set dates. That's why we don't set dates. I mean, we're excited. I'm excited for Jesus' return. I hope it happens today. But Jesus didn't tell us to date set. He told us to be watching, to be ready, to do business, to mm -hmm. preach the gospel. And we do know the season. I mean, that's important because Jesus did answer the question in the Olivet Discourse, and maybe one day we'll get into all of that. But the, he, they asked him, when is the end of the age? And he told them in Matthew 24. So he wanted us to know, and he gave us the signs of what the end of the age looked like and of his return, mm -hmm. as well as the destruction of Jerusalem. But that's a different question. Yes. Well, excellent answer on this one. I, I think a lot of people will be satisfied with that. I hope so. so. Moving on, question two from Ken. Was Daniel 927 fulfilled by the Pope's declaration to many on May 26, 2021 of the Ludato Sea? I hope I didn't butcher that action platform. He is supposed to present it soon to the UN for their adoption. If so, will this start the clock on Daniel's 70th week? 
There's a couple things on this question, and the reason why it even comes up is because um, the Pope made this declaration. This was actually something that originated not in, not in May. That was when he kind of publicized it, but he had written an encyclical, which are these typical for popes. They write a theolog theological treatise, and they throw it out there. And this is particularly one on the climate, on the climate change idea, and, and he's jumped on the bandwagon of that. But one of the things that he mentioned in there is just trying to get the world on board to take care of Mother Earth, and he uses a lot of this language. But um, the reason why it comes up is because he specifically said that in May, we are going, I'm going to go to the United Nations and I'm going to present this um, treatise, this agreement. Let's come up with an agreement that will be fulfilled in seven years. So he put a time frame on it from 2021 and, until 2028. And, and, and naturally people recognized, hey, is this, could this be the Antichrist, the signing of the covenant? And the short answer is no. It's not that we, again, agree with what the Pope's doing or really in any of that. But the, the, the only common denominator is this idea of a seven-year situation. Um, and so just last week, a couple weeks ago, he had gone and he presented it to the United Nations um, Climate Forum just, again, giving his overall approach to how the world could take care of the planet. Um, in reality, when we look at what the Pope is doing, there's no, the Pope has no authority in the world. I mean, he has authority in, in the religious world over the Catholic Church. Um, but in reality, throughout the last century, uh, the influence of the Popes have really has gone down a, a, a tremendous amount. So what we do know is in Daniel 9.27, um, the Antichrist does. He, he confirms the covenant with the many. The many here is Israel, not the United Nations. Um, we know that from the context of Daniel 9. But he makes that covenant with them for this final seven-year period. And then um, in the middle of it, it is, again, it's an agreement with Israel, not the United Nations, because in reality, uh, it's, it would be surprising that the climate uh, change, the climate um, care of this particular covenant has nothing to do with Israel particular. And even the idea in, in Daniel 9, 27, where it says in the middle of the week, he stops the sacrifices, the daily sacrifices from happening. That has really no context in, in the climate change uh, aspect. He didn't reference it. He didn't make comment on it. Nothing to do with Israel specific, nothing to do with sacrifices. And so uh, the only connection is a seven year. So in the short answer, the answer is no. Um, it, it's not connected with what the Pope has done. And we just, w w again, time will tell, but I, I, not even for a glimpse do I see it having any connection. Yeah, very interesting question. Yeah, it is an interesting. We appreciate that question. Okay, moving right along to Catherine's question from Facebook. People in hell are waiting for the great white throne judgment. Where are they till then? Doesn't it say at the end of time about the great white throne judgment that the ones not in the book of life will be cast in hell? Where are they till then? That's a very sobering question. You know, it is sobering. It's a common question that we get because uh, oftentimes in English, um, we take the word hell and we, we run with it. And uh, when we tell someone or we think about somebody going to hell, automatically they think in terms of fire. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's fine, but it's not, um, it lacks specificity. And so when, when you think about um, theology, we don't base our theology on English. We base it on really the Greek New Testament. Um, and what we see in, in Luke chapter 16, 19 through 31, Jesus is making, uh, he's telling this narrative. I believe it's not a parable because parables generally don't have names and this one has names in it. And uh, so he's telling a narrative uh, of about, uh, the, we know the, the story, the rich man and um, Lazarus. And so uh, the rich man dies. It says he goes into Hades. So that's important. Hades is a very important word. Uh, he goes into Hades and he's in torment. And as the parable goes on, or the story goes on, not a parable, the story goes on. Um, then Lazarus dies. And Lazarus goes to a place uh, described as Abraham's bosom. And it says um, there's some discussion that had happened between the two compartments, if you wanted to say it that way. And we're going to put a little graphic up on the screen here that I think will help illustrate what is being described in Luke 16. And so you have these two compartments at the time that Hades was divided into a place of torment. And as Jesus tells the story, there's a great chasm separating the two. And on the other side was a place of, of comfort. Um, Abraham says that to this gentleman. 
uh, to the rich man, says, hey, you're tormented in the flame, but we're over here and we can't cross from there and you can't cross over here, but Lazarus is now comforted over here. So uh, scholars will recognize that these two compartments, one is, it, they're both Hades. One could be called the torment side and the other could be called the Abraham's bosom side or the paradise side. That's an important thing as well because um, Jesus says later, um, that he is going to be, in Matthew 12, verse 40, he's talking about the resurrection, and the Pharisees were asking for a sign, and he says, hey, no sign's going to be given to you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the belly or the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So we, we have this idea as well um, that, we'll talk about that in the next question mm -hmm. uh, more specifically, but in Greek, you have the idea of Hades and you have the idea of Gehenna. Gehenna is uh, a word that is used um, to speak about really the, the lake of fire, the eternal fire in Revelation chapter 20 and Matthew 25, verse 41 and 46. You have those passages there. Think of it this way. Um, she asked the question, where are they now? Um, when someone dies right now, or even at the time of Jesus, as an unbeliever, they go... As, as Luke 16 tells us, they go directly into Hades, this place of torment. Think of it like a holding cell. Think of it like a county jail. You know, you go to county jail, you're there for, you're waiting there temporarily for your arraignment. Your arraignment, you come, you, you, you get um, either, uh, you get judged or at your final sentencing, you're there in county jail or whatever. Then when you come to your sentencing, it's over, it's done, and now you're sentenced to prison which is maybe it's a life imprisonment or whatever. Maybe it's many lives. So think of it that way, that Hades in the New Testament would be considered county jail. It's a temporary place until your final sentencing. She brings up, rightly, Revelation chapter 20, where it's the great white throne judgment. There's no, there's no believers at the great white throne judgment. This isn't a matter of determining whether they're saved or not saved. That's determined upon death. We know that from Hebrews 9.27. But when you get to... There at the great white throne, Jesus raises all of the unbelievers that have been hanging out, not together, this isn't party time, they've been in their cells in Hades. He raises them up from the dead and they come to stand before him. The books are open and at that moment, uh, the book of life is opened and they're not found there, which if they were, they wouldn't be here anyway. But then the other books are opened in order to provide um, testimony for them to receive their sentence, which is a justified sentence because ultimately they have rejected um, God. And, and for some people, uh, they've rejected the gospel and the free gift of salvation in Jesus. So at that time, they are then sentenced to Gehenna, which is the lake of fire, which is sobering. It's permanent. That's why we're here to share the gospel, to, to make sure that people understand that you, we don't want anybody to go there. And so if we think about it in those terms, that's why even in Revelation 20, it talks about Hades and death being thrown into the lake of fire. This, this, this local compartment is no longer needed, and it's thrown into the lake of fire. And so the other, uh, well, we'll talk about that in the next question. So I think this is a good setup for the next question. Jackie from Facebook asks, how come Jesus told the thief on the cross, you will be with me in paradise, but Jesus didn't go to paradise that day. Like you said, he was in the belly for three days. Yes. So this is, this is a great question because, um, you know, what happened to Jesus during the three days? I mean, he does say to the thief on the cross, uh, you will be with me today in paradise. And so the thief on the cross who had faith, uh, it was very minimal faith. He, all he said was remember me, but isn't that great that we're saved even by a mustard seed? And so in that regard, Jesus dies and he goes, as he said in Matthew 12, 40, he went into the heart of the earth. He didn't ascend into heaven. Um, he says that he had not ascended to the Father. He tells that to Mary in John 20, 21. I have not yet ascended to the Father. And uh, so his spirit, he dies, his body goes in the tomb. His spirit goes down into the heart of the earth, which we would read is Hades. Hades in general, remember, Hades is uh, not necessarily bad only. Hades just means the place of the underworld or the place of the dead. It's, it's where spirits go. Again, they go as, as Luke 16. If you're a rejecter of God, you go to the place of torment. If you're a believer, like uh, the rich man, he goes to Abraham's bosom. The thief goes to Abraham's bosom. Jesus, I would imagine, as he said, in the heart of the earth, goes to Abraham's bosom. So there he is, 
uh, in, which is also known as paradise, uh, this, this place of comfort. Uh, additionally, we know from 1 Peter 3, uh, t- really 20 and 21, there's this interesting phrase that Peter brings up about Jesus going and proclaiming. Some versions will say preached. Caruso is the word. It doesn't necessarily need to be preached like preached as a gospel. It's this idea of proclaiming. So in 1 Peter 3, it says, Jesus went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Uh, What did he proclaim? And we don't want to get into all the theology there, but it's fascinating that uh, you have this long war against God, uh, including all the angelic realm. And uh, we know from 2 Peter 2, 4, that um, you have angels, the fallen angels that uh, sinned in the time of Noah with human women, um, Jude 6 as well, and they got cast, cast down to what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 4, Tartarus, which just happens to be the lowest place of Hades, a place of terrible torment and darkness and chains. And it's, so if we wrap this up, when Jesus dies, he does go to paradise, but he takes a trip. He takes a trip down to Tartarus, uh, if we compare 2 Peter 2, 4 and 1 Peter 3, 20, to proclaim his victory over these fallen angelic um, hosts that sought to rebel and to thwart God's plan. It's pretty fascinating, too, because in Colossians 2, verse 15, it says that Jesus publicly triumphed over the, the forces of darkness on the cross, and he, he, he triumphed over them and disarmed them, and put them to public shame. Which is pretty amazing, because if you look at 1 Corinthians 2, 7, and 8, it says something similar, that if the forces of, or the rulers of this world had known, they would have never killed him. But when they killed him, they sealed their own fate. And so we have this, again, very enigmatic phrase in 1 Peter 3, 20, that Jesus is down here for three days. Uh, he's not, as some theologies say, that he's not in hell getting punished and getting beat up by Satan, I mean, that is just heresy. Jesus said in John 19.30 that uh, it is finished. The payment was made to tell us the, the debt has been paid. So he's down there hanging out with the thief in paradise. He's hanging out with Abraham. Uh, he, again, we, he went and t- took a visit to proclaim uh, his victory over the angelic, false angelic evil realm that were in prison. And uh, it says they were in prison and that they were in chains. And then we know three days later, he's resurrected. He, he returns, he gets a glorified body. He exists for, he's on earth for 40 days until he ascends, and then he ascends to his father. So um, that's really the answer is he did go, and he was there, and his promise to the thief was fulfilled. As is every other promise yes. that he's ever made. Moving on to Steph. She asks, so many routinely teach that Nephilim are some sort of an angel-human hybrid, It's certainly a fine story to tell, but I don't see how that in any way agrees with Scripture. Specifically, very early on, we are many times told that the reproduction is done by kind. Why would humans differ? You know, this, I think, is an absolute excellent question. Mm -hmm. Because um, I appreciate that she's looking at it biblically, and she's puzzling it through. And she's trying to look at what Scripture talks um, in Genesis and and we don't have it, we won't go through all of them, but she had listed several times, and we could look in Scripture where God says, um, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees, each after their own kind. Uh, you see later, God created sea monsters in Genesis 1.21, every living creature that moves, and they, after their own kind, after their own kind. And so you have this idea that God instilled in the natural world that not only all life, Okay, plants, animals, humans, etc., would reproduce after their own kind. So God p- put limits in the natural world on this. Uh, that's why if you take like a horse and a donkey, it'll produce a mule, but a mule cannot continue to reproduce because there are two different kinds to some degree. They can produce an animal, but it's become sterile. And so we see this in the natural world, in the biological world. It's a great thing. God set boundaries. We also know today... We're all familiar with the idea of genetically modified organisms, right? GMOs. We don't necessarily like GMOs at times. But what they're doing is they're going in and they're crossbreeding, uh, so far we know, at least plants and animals, but they also know they have crossbred uh, certain animals like 
for example, they would uh, crossbreed spiders and, and some of the milk that would be produced by animals had like a, like a very strong silky steel, you know, webs are very strong. It's really interesting. So humans are overruling, or not overruling, they, they are contaminating God's natural created order. And so humans have done it and they're going to continue to try to do what they talk about. This is the phrase of chimeras. Um, but God had put and said, hey, this is the, nat- the way the natural world will work. Don't violate it, okay? But she asked the question, well, if Nephilim are the offspring, according to Genesis 6-4, of fallen angels and human women, that can't be the case because God said that um, things only can reproduce after their own kind. And I would answer that in two ways to say that is 100% true in the natural world. Um, God sets up rules, but as we've already stated, mankind is getting in there and... Um, they're not very good at following God's rules sometimes. They're not following God's rules. And so they are uh, going against and mixing kinds together. And so um, the natural world is set up by God to have a certain order to it. But one of the things that is interesting is that um, in, one of the, in the answer I gave to her is, for example, in the natural world, uh, the sun, you know, the, the earth um, spins and you have daylight. Well, in Joshua chapter 10, God overruled. God can overrule supernaturally. That's important here in one sense. Uh, God supernaturally overrules the day. And so Joshua, it's the only time in history, he says, Lord, please let not the sun go down. So God stops to some, in some way the rotation of the earth and allows the day to last longer than the normal 24 hours so that Joshua can, can f- pursue his enemies. That's a very supernatural thing. It violated the order that God had said in Genesis 1, verse 14 through 16 about the sun and the moon and and all that. Uh, We also see that um, what's the natural order of humanity? We die. That's natural. Um, It wasn't that way in the beginning, but it is natural now. But God, whenever Jesus raised somebody from the dead, he supernaturally reversed the normal order of things. So God can supernaturally overrule his order when, from an outside perspective. Um, let me give you another uh, an example of a fallen angel or a fallen creature, a fallen being. Uh, for example, in the book of Job, Job chapter 1 and 2, um, we know that Satan is given permission to attack Job's body. He wasn't allowed to kill him. But he was able, think about this, he was able to touch Job's body to a certain degree to create boils all over his body. That's not natural. Um, it was something that, that occurred, obviously those weren't in Job's body to begin with, but supernaturally Satan came and he supernaturally overruled by God's permission um, the natural order of things. And so what we're trying to say here is that, yes, under normal circumstances, death rules, there's no exception. Under normal circumstances, animals that are sterile don't reproduce. So, however, when it comes to um, really this example of these fallen angels, if Satan can come along in the book of Job and overrule the natural order by God's permission, then it's no surprise. It doesn't violate scripture. It violates God's natural order, but God allowed it for his reasons. No different than a miracle, a raising of the dead. Um, So in Genesis 6, when these these sons of God, that's really what it says, when they come down and they present themselves and they mate with human women, yes, they are violating the natural order. Um, They are coming along just like Satan did to Job in a supernatural way. This, This doesn't mean that it couldn't happen. It just wasn't supposed to happen. It was part of God's order and rule. So when they come down to do this, they violate uh, this natural order of things, and God is upset. And that, that's really, interestingly, the question actually shows why God is so upset. Um, and it actually, I think, shows, helps provide evidence for why these are sons of God, these fallen angels. Uh, we've written about it in other contexts, uh, Genesis 6, 2 and 6, 4. But I'll read to you um, in, in Jude 1, verse 6, which I think gives us evidence. In 2 Peter 2, 4, we see that these angels that sinned were cast down to Tartarus. Um, they sinned at the time of Noah. And in Jude 1, 6, Jude is, is speaking about this same time frame. He says, And the angels who did not stay with 
within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling uh, or natural dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So in Jude 1, 6, we have these angels leaving their natural domain. Now, it, it, it hasn't talked about what they did yet, but they left their natural domain and they invaded into the natural world. And then in verse 7, this is the key. Just as, that's a, that's a I mean, coordinating conjunction in Greek. If you, it's connecting the two ideas. Very clearly, these angels that sinned in verse 6 sinned just as the people that sinned in verse 7. And it says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise, so again, now you have another connection. They likewise um, indulged in sexual immorality. They, okay, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah, they, they sinned in, with sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire. So there's that word, unnatural. It was beyond the natural order. Serve, an exa- serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of fire. So what Jude is saying there is that there's two connections. These angels that sinned, they went against the, the natural order. They, they left their position of authority. They left their natural dwelling. They came and they sinned as Sodom and Gomorrah did in a sexual way and according to unnatural desire. And that's why they're judged in um, eternal fire and chains. So when we look at this question, again, it's a great question. Uh, how can there can be reproduction uh, between angels and women when it, God says it's, you can't do it according to kind? And what we'd say is it's according to a supernatural intervention, which put aside God's natural order. And these, these beings are supernatural. Obviously, God didn't tell them to do it, but he allowed them to do it in the sense that he didn't give them permission as far as we know, but he allowed evil to take its course for a reason. And so again, it is a great question, but it reminds us of the, way, of the natural order of things. And we do have supernatural events. We have supernatural um, situations where God allows that to be. And we're going to see this as we come to the end times, that um, even with the Antichrist, the Antichrist is the seed of Satan. And he comes and he gets supposedly resurrected from the dead in Revelation 13. And uh, he's a son of perdition. And so you have this, this same really technology that God is going to allow in a very specific time, uh, this overruling of supernatural. We're going to see in Revelation 9, uh, demonic hordes coming upon the earth and, and tormenting man. So it's going to be uh, what, what is normally reserved as a separate world. Those from the spirit world are going to come in. And again, it's, it's, not, it's not the normal way of things. So she is very correct that the normal way of things is kind after kind. But when supernatural beings get involved, God himself, healing, it can be overruled. Wow. This whole question and your answer has just made me think about how we live in a natural world, but really everything about our life is not natural. It is super, there is so much supernatural mm-hmm. involvement, both from from good and from evil. And, yeah. and it's so important to be equipped and to be aware and to learn and to ask these kinds of questions. Yeah. Because if we don't know it, then we're gonna be deceived so easily. And the rest of the world is, we're the ones yeah. that need to proclaim the truth, so. Amen to that. I mean, it's, when you look at the gospel period as well, I mean, just another little example that comes to mind is, it's not normal for humans to break chains, you know, and yet these, some of these men who were demonically possessed, they, the Bible says in the Gospels that they showed supernatural strength of breaking chains and bonds and other things. And, and so uh, under the normal rules, uh, that you, we don't have the strength to do that. But with supernatural, you know, non-human intervention in this, this way and, and that strength and empowerment. But again, these are great questions. And uh, once again, we tell you, if you do have questions... Uh, send them to questions at prophecywatchers.com and we will continue to come and answer them. So Karen, I appreciate you being here today. And, uh, you know, we just ask for your prayers for this ministry, whether you like it or not, whether we, we sh- hopefully will admit it and embrace it. Uh, Ephesians 6 verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we are in a war. There's a wrestling match that we're involved in and we can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, really through the power of the gospel as well. So we certainly would appreciate your prayers for us. You know, one of the things that I would ask is, Every single day, you know, I used to ask this when I was pastoring, is um, when you sit down and you pray for your dinner or you pray for your meal, 
Um, I encourage you to pray for your local church as well every time when you do that. But also, if you can, Lord willing, uh, throw in a prayer for us that God would continue to, to guide us and to provide for us and to protect us. We know that the enemy uh, does not like what we're doing here. We have opportunities to go around the world and certainly not only through the internet but through other means. And so again, thank you for watching today. Appreciate your prayers. And as always, be watching, be ready. Uh, we believe that Jesus is coming soon to collect his bride and we want to be ready for that. So have a great week.